Hello club members. Yes, wine club members, this video is for you. I have no idea if the sound is echoey. I apologize for that, but I wanted to show you the broad expanse of the May Wine Club wines. Yeah, 12 bottles here that we want to tell you about in a video. And the reason for the video this month is because my notes will be shorter than usual. You should have seen those notes like last Friday. They haven't come out yet. And to be frank, I'm still trying to dig out mentally from the pandemic and from a year and a half of doing business a different way where things weren't necessarily easier, but they happened at a different rate and they happened without the complication of wine bar menus and event menus and event planning. And now we're very, very blessed to be easing back into that mode. And uh, yet my head and my body is not ready for that, apparently, because I'm way behind schedule on things that we've been doing all along, including providing you with great wine club wines every month. So why not a video for the first time ever that describes all 12 wines? And I'll tell you what, instead of that Starbucks cup you see up there in the foreground, you're going to see the wine you are getting somewhere in this video. If you push the little thing on the bottom of the screen along, what do they call that, a slider? You know, if you want to hear only about the wine that you're getting in your club, just get that bottle in front of you so you recognize the label and then match it with what you can find on this video. How about that? So here we go. Let's try this out and put up wine number one. And let's start by saying that after a good slurp of coffee, because I'm going to need it, I'm going to taste all these wines with you. Or without you. And for that, I'm going to need a spit bucket, right? So, um, hmm. <laughs> I'm climbing under this beautiful table of mine. I built this. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? At any rate, I am now under my surfboard table, and now I am re-emerging with a spit bucket that will hold at least 12 sips of wine. <laughs> uh, this is my office. Uh, this these are surfboards I tried to ride on and gave up and turned them into decoration and said, this is a table I built, which can accommodate 12 bottles of wine and even more than that, as uh, in times of old was proven at many a great party. We used to line up bottles from all of our friends coming to the party along this table. That was cool. What I want to say first about wine club notes is that nowadays, any intrepid user of the internet can go find out about these wines, certain things about their wines on, the, on, uh, on their own. They can go to the website for the winery, maybe even go to wine.com. That is actually a very useful to tool. If wine.com carries it, you will see good information about the wine, whether or not it gets some nice ratings. And uh, you know, you can end up there. So why write a full page of wine club notes every month, which as I said, I might not be doing this month. They might be abbreviated. But the point is, why should we write all this stuff that you already know? Well, we try to provide you with, yeah, a few facts. Like this is 70% Cabernet, 20% Cab Franc, and 10% whatever. But the main reason for writing the notes is to tell you why we chose these wines for you. How we thought they might connect with you. And so, when you come to the wine steward, you're going to find great wine. You're going to find great wine that we're trying to hook up with a particular customer, meaning you in particular. And yet, what you're really buying is another product as well called curation. We curate these wines. And part of curation is telling you why these wines meant something to us and why we felt like they would mean something to you. So there's something kind of personal about every one of these selections this month and every month. It might be a relationship with the vendor. It might be the fact that we've gotten to visit this area, a particular area that the wine represents. 
Uh, you know, let's see what kind of stories come out of each one. We won't go over long. This it should be about a 24 minute video if I do it right. With obviously about a 20 minute <laughs> preview that is now over because we are going to tell you first about California Wine Club wines coming to the California Wine Lovers. The California Wine Lovers Club gets two bottles of red every month. And even though the name is California Wine Lovers Club, we do often represent to you Washington State red wines and very occasionally Oregon wines. Maybe we should call it West Coast Wine Club. Basically, they're domestic reds with fruit forward flavors and thoughtfulness as well. What we have here is fruit forward flavor and thoughtfulness in one bottle called Tilth Zinfandel. We recently gave their Cabernet to our Red Collector Club. This is, instead of being the Napa Valley Cabernet that we gave the club to the Red Collectors a few months ago, this wine going to the California Wine Lovers Club is a California designated Zinfandel from Tilth. It is small production. These are thoughtful folks. It's a man and wife team. And I don't know all that much about her. I think she's worked in the restaurant business and I know that he has. He's a former chef, but he's also done winemaking work at Honeycut and a few other places up in the Napa Valley before getting the wine bug so bad he gave up the cooking thing and got into wine. Tilt Zinfandel is called California as the designation because it is made uh, from wine, from grapes coming from different places in California. So you can't say Napa or Mendocino or Lodi or Contra Costa because in fact, the fruit comes from all of those places. What you have here is a Zinfandel based wine. In order for it to be called Zin, it has to be 75%, but that gives you 25% of leeway if you wanna work on flavors and smells and textures. So let's get this into my glass. Maybe you'll get it into yours. We'll try Tilth Zinfandel and say in the meantime that the other players, those other grapes involved this year around are a little bit of Syrah and a little bit of Carignan and a little bit of a grape called Valdigui, V-A-L-D-I-G-U-I-E. I think I spelled that correctly. Formerly, historically, traditionally known in the Napa Valley, at least, as Napa Gamay. Napa Gamay is not the true Gamay grape as grown in Beaujolais, and now it's been correctly identified as this French grape, which is more accurately called Val de Guy. So that's happening in this wine. Um, most importantly, Lodi and Mendocino and Contra Costa County are represented here. The Contra Costa County Zinfandel happening in here, I think is making its presence felt with a brash uh, fruit forward quality with also some crazy fun kind of briary qualities as well. It's a wine that you know has big fruit, especially if you air it. Uh, I found that with 10 minutes of airing, the wine filled out and became a little more enriched, but it's got a lot of good energy at first and Zin always should, because Zin, as big as it is, can like saturate the palate. It can give you too much. And so what you hope for alongside is some acidity or energy. I'm using the energy word a lot. I know it's kind of my pet phrase, but I'd like a wine, especially if it's gonna be a big wine, to have energy. That is an acidic balance that keeps this rich, delicious, yummy experience also simultaneously refreshing. I opened this bottle yesterday because I thought I was going to start writing the wine club notes yesterday. I decided to clean this office instead. So this bottle sat open, unreported, at least so far, and it's drinking very well right now. So that's another great thing about energy or higher acidity, higher acid wines is that they age better and they overnight better. So this Tilt Zenfidel is doing that for me. It's got a nice saucy, rich fruit, and yet it's got energy. I love it. It's very good. It's no wonder that a former chef made this wine, thinking about perhaps how this might work with a product from the kitchen. And you're probably noting that I haven't said anything personal about this yet. What's the personal link? Why are we curating this? Well, we're curating it too because it's small production. It's fairly local. It's really good. And number four, uh, uh, a wonderful woman named Meredith sells it to us. And this may be, in fact, be the last 
wine club placements we ever buy from Meredith, not because she's passed away, um, but because she's moving. She's, uh, she's set, heading to a promotion and to another area of sales in uh, the wine world. So she's moving regions, becoming an import specialist. And this is a person who has actually provided you and us with a lot of wine club wines over the last year and a half or two. We're gonna miss her dearly. This is the swan song. Uh, if I say any more, I'm gonna break down. So we got a lot more wines to talk about. So I gotta keep it together. Damn it, Meredith, why are you leaving? Let's tell you about this. Pretty cool looking label. Fifth Moon apparently refers to the Vietnamese Summer Solstice Festival. And I have no idea why they chose to name this wine that. Uh, there's no very good explanation on the website. I know I should sit down, but I want to get up and have some wine. So let's do this Napa Valley product. Yes, this time all Napa Valley, which is unique. As soon as things come only from the Napa Valley, they tend to cost more. We had to do quite a bit of haggling to get this wine down to a particular price that would accommodate the wine club budget. But when I tasted it, I knew it was worth the haggling. The personal connection here is this comes from a vendor we've worked with for a very, very long time, but have hardly ever given a wine club placement to. So this is just kind of our congratulations to a really nice guy named Dennis for finally landing a club wine here. All Napa fruit, small production. The winemaker was the chief enologist for Opus One for a while. He also did work at, I believe, Cliff Lady Winery in the Napa Valley. And now this is his personal project. He makes other wines too, but this particular one, the Fifth Moon Red, is based on, get this, I've never seen a blend quite like this, almost equal amounts of Merlot, Zinfandel, and Syrah. Pretty cool. What would we anticipate? I think we throw anticipation out the window and just smell this wine and taste it and feel it. And I will tell you why feeling a wine is just as important as those other two things, tasting and smelling. I mean, always smell your wine. Cool. Uh, I get red fruit and cedar and like, like a red, freshly turned red earth as if it's clay with some iron in it. Herb, there's a lot to say, but the whole, if I smell one thing, it's mildness. It's not like full frontal purple, purpleness. It's a, it's a mild mannered red. Very attractive, but good complexity. Spice, yeah, fun wine. Mm. <laughs> flavors are delicious. I'm getting my energy that I want. I'm getting red fruit flavors. Again, there's the earth, but it's earth complemented by fruit. And most importantly, Texture, most important to this wine experience in particular, I think. The, the textures are juicy and easy. This is an easy drinking wine. Does that mean it's wimpy? Does that mean it's light? No, it's got significant California fruit, but it happens in a very happy-go-lucky, careless, you know, what the hell kind of a way. It's not like, boom, it's not hitting you hard like the Petite Sera that we may club you next week, uh, next month. This is more about just freaking delicious wine that is easy going on the palate. And all Napa fruit and a very interesting combination of grapes, don't you think? Merlot and Syrah and Zinfandel put together. Fifth Moon, the first time we've ever clubbed it. One of the first times we've clubbed a wine with Dennis. So good job, Dennis. Like that wine. What do you do with a mild-mannered wine like this? I think this is what you can serve to the crowd, and this is where you're not necessarily trying to beat it over the head with over-the-top food. I don't think baby back ribs with a bunch of sauce on them uh, are, is going to work here. I think you want to take it down a little bit. Chicken off the grill, great. And um, veal, if you've ever heard of veal and done that, or if you do that, that would be lovely with this wine. You want a more elegant meal. Um, uh, turn down the flavors a little bit to match the turned down style of this wine. We're now going to go to the World Class Club wine selection. The World Class Club gives you two bottles of red every month that 
are um, from anywhere but here. Well, occasionally we do give you a grape Syrah or something domestic in it, but it tends to give you foreign red wine. Let's take you this time to the Colchagua Valley of Chile. This time I'm gonna pour mine and then show you the label. The personal connection here, like why is this important? Why are we curating it? Well, we are always curating because we believe there's quality happening here. Quality that will resonate with enough of you for you to want to come in and buy some more. But the personal point is that, uh, well, a year and a half ago now, David Everett, who can be credited with sustaining and bringing up the quality and basically running the show out at Las Casitas College in their wine category, you know, the, the, all the wine curriculum out there, in viticulture, winemaking, and uh, wine appreciation classes, David has something to do with all of this. Well, David asked us to teach the wine, Wines of the Old World class uh, a couple of years ago, and since then we've had a better, more partnering relationship, and so even when I was through teaching that semester, he came to us with, for the wines, he asked the wine steward to provide the wines, all the wines, for his next courses. And so this wine from Chile, it was a special request. He had to show two wines from South America and said, can I get a good red from Chile that has some Carbonara in it? But you know, beyond that criteria, you choose, Jim. We found on this, because there was also a price point involved, you know, there's always a budget. And um, we thought this was a great wine for that. So this has appeared before students in the Wines of the Old World class as taught by David Everett. And now I was remembering it and I thought, why not give it to the World Class Wine Club wine, uh, wine members as well? Here is a really cool blend that does include Carmenere, the eccentric uh, Lost Bordeaux grape. And Carmenere all by itself can often be too much Carmenere. And so the nice thing is there are six grape varieties involved here. I got it all written down because I would never remember them all here. So let's at this time refer to my notes and say this is composed of 35% Cabernet Sauvignon, 23% Cab Franc, 17% Malbec, 11% Carmenere. There's Chile's last Bordeaux grape, 8% Merlot, and 6% Petit Verdot. Let's factor in what's happening here as far as how old it is. I think it's a 15 or a 16. No, it's a 17. But even then, it's a, it's a what? It's almost a five-year-old red. So it's been mellowing. And if Carmenere was sticking out a little bit too far a year and a half ago when I gave it to David in his class, and even then it wasn't, even now it's even more calm. I'm reminded a little bit of a traditional California Cabernet blend. In other words, what they tasted like, say, before vintage 1997, before the big swing in stylistic preference. We could go into why that happened, what that means, but all I'll say is, in this case, there's just as much herb and earth and spice as there is fruit. This is a mild-mannered, comprehensive red wine. It says kind of everything instead of having one feature that I just mentioned sticking out too far. So it's not too green, it's not too red, it's not too modern, it's not too classical. Mm. It's very nice, it's developed, it is ready. And I think I would have proteins, I know I would have proteins with this wine, it's a, it's a true food wine great acidity and structure, some tannin, but wonderful complexity per what I just said. And I think what I would do is involve lamb or uh, maybe, how about shish kebabs of beef or chicken with that Eastern, Middle Eastern spice called za'atar involved. I believe, the more I think about it, this wine would go well with a Greek or Turkish style shish kebab little bit of smoke on that meat would be great and the acidity in this wine will will work on the protein in your food be a good marriage i think right on so that's kind of that classy more classically styled wine and ironically it does come from a wine area that we call the new world part of the new world of wine 
Chile is kind of like a gray area there. I mean, Chile can be rather old world in style, but it's part of the new world in wine geography. Well, let's now go to the old world and give you something decidedly more new world. I know that's confusing, but the other wine you're getting in your club, bring on the uh, tissue paper. <laughs> this is kind of silly the way they package this up, but they do it every year, every year that you've seen it, because in fact, world-class club members have seen this bottle, previous vintages thereof, several times. We like to club this wine. We like to say that even though a wine comes from geographically the old world, it could behave very much in a new world way. New world meaning, you know, higher alcohol, more enriched by a higher alcohol, and uh, more fruit forward. So this is Vatan. This comes from a region called Toro. Actually, this is kind of cool. I've got this gizmo here on my table right now. I bought this in Toro. I gave one to my old friend Kent Sheldon and kept one for myself. This is a, a representation of something they unearthed here. It's a, thought to be a Neolithic representation of a bull. And this was scooped up out of the earth somewhere near the town of Toro. So Toro is in fact a town. It's a wine region in northern Spain. You're about two hours away north and west of Madrid by going to Toro. And Toro, just like many other regions, wine regions of Spain, grows Spain's most famous grape, which is Tempranillo. But, um, or Anne, these regions all tend to have their own pet name, like regional name, for the Tempranillo grape. So here they won't say, we grow Tempranillo, we grow, instead, Tinta de Toro. That's their local name for Tempranillo. And they would say, our Tempranillo is different from their Tempranillo. Of course, this is wonderful. This is like old world uh, localism, right? Pride of place. I love it. I never want the world to become too homogenized so that there are McDonald's and Starbucks on every corner, even though the Starbucks comes in handy. I hope they never put one in Toro. It's a great little town. It overlooks the Duero River. You've heard of the Duero River. That turns into the Duero River. Not too far from Toro, it turns it into the Douro River when it goes over the boundary into Portugal and then spills out near Porto. At any rate, that's where we are in northern Spain. 100% Tempranillo, or more locally correctly said, Tinta de Toro. And this got opened, like, I think last Saturday. So I don't necessarily anticipate this bottle still killing it. However, Tempranillo, Tinta de Toro, whatever you want to call it, has wonderful qualities of preservation. Tempranillo loves its air. It does not mind at all. It prefers to be decanted. This particular wine is picked off of own rooted, in other words, no grafting necessary because of the sandy soils that resist the phylloxera rouse, louse, and uh, gosh, the vines, Providing this wine are at least 100, 120 years old, I believe. Very old vines, which are still alive because that phylloxera louse cannot abide sandy soil, where these roots reach down deep, probably 50 feet down to find a little bit of water to work on. In fact, this wine still has good stuff going on. I think I would have rather had it a couple days ago. I've been checking in on this partic particular bottle ever since Saturday. What's today, Tuesday? And now it's getting a little more caramely in the nose, but it's still quite attractive. I can see a lot of you actually liking where this wine is right now. Mm. Mm. This is one aspect of Tempranillo. A week ago, we had people sitting on our mezzanine trying four different Tempranillos, two of them from Rivera del Duero, which is not far from here, and two from Rioja. We were going to include this wine. This is included in your wine club because we couldn't include yet another Tempranillo in that Spanish wine event. And because we've liked Vuitton for a long time. And because we welcome Heather to the position of Chambers and Chambers wine rep, having taken over from uh, Felipe, who was fantastic, but Felipe also, like Meredith, got a promotion <laughs> is leaving us. Well, with tears in my eyes, I welcome Heather and give her her first Wine Steward Wine Club 
situation. Whereas the Chilean wine was structured and classical, now you have big, massive, higher alcohol, admittedly, potent fruit. I promise you, open this bottle when your California wine-loving people come over. You know who they are, and you know that you still want to speak to them. And where there are a lot of differences between a lot of people right now, we need things, whether wines or whatever, where we get back together. This will be unifying. You will appreciate the Tempranillo aspects of it, the fact that it comes from a really cool place called Toro, and the fact that it does go with big masculine foods. They will appreciate this wine's alignment with New World, with the fruit forwardness of a big wine from California. So, Batan happens again. Let's not belabor the point. Let's get this massive bottle oh, off the table. And we will now tell you about the two wines that we've chosen for our Wine Adventurer Wine Club. We're going to put in front of you first a rather whimsically labeled bottle, which takes a little explanation. Then you'll say, hey, that's kind of cool. Look at that. Crazy. A graffiti-laden label. It says Passimento on it. And Passimento comes from very near... Verona, Italy. Verona. Verona is where the uh, mythical Romeo and Juliet did their thing. And in fact, there's a balcony over a courtyard, a courtyard that is visited by hundreds, if not thousands of people per day. They get in line to go into this courtyard. That was basically, uh, it's become a circus, a venue that was invented out of thin air by some kind of great event planner <laughs> to say, this is where it happened. This is where Romeo and Juliet uh, wooed each other, where Romeo was standing under the balcony and, and uh, where for out there, Romeo, all that stuff. Well, of course that never happened. That was in Shakespeare's play and it never certainly happened in that courtyard. But that is the place where people go, where these pilgrims of love line up by the dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands, to visit this place. And they're going through a little corridor on their way there, kind of a tunnel. And uh, to get into the courtyard, you are looking at walls that are covered with graffiti. And there are love notes scrawled all over the place, and hearts. And there's chewing gum holding <laughs> love notes affixed to the wall. It's, it's a little disgusting, but it's also beautiful. And somebody took a picture of that and made this label. Why are we doing that? Because we're in fact drinking a wine from Verona, from very, grown very, very near there. And this is the land of Amarone. The most famous red wine from here is Amarone. I'm sure you've heard of that. It's a very ripe Italian red. And if an American who does not like foreign wine, especially Italian wine, for all of its tangy acidity, is ever going to like an Italian wine, he or she is going to admire Amarone because it works rather opposite to that lean and tangy food-loving thing. You don't necessarily have to have food with Amarone. It's already generous. It's food. You're drinking food. It's <laughs> yummy. Well, how is that made? It's made by drying grapes. You dry the grapes for months to make Amarone before you uh, crush them and ferment them and then turn them into wine. So what happens in the meantime if you, is you've lost a significant percentage of water by drying those grapes up in these attics and they are in baskets that are perforated so that there's airflow and you don't uh, have a lot of rot or you're trying to prevent any rot. You've got fans blowing. You're up in the attics of wineries because that's the warmer, warmest part of the building. And that is how this wine was made, albeit for uh, the drying time did not occur for months, like three or four months. I think it was like more like 30 days or 45 days. And so this is kind of like baby Amarone, but it's got Amarone's friendliness. The, the process of drying those grapes is called apassimento. And this is kind of a nickname, passimento, remembering the fact that these grapes were dried. What grapes are they? Well, this wine is mostly, it's actually about one third each, Merlot, Croatina, and Corvina. Corvina is the best known grape of this area. It is the Amarone grape, sometimes getting a little help from its friends. In this case, Croatina adds a little structure. You need some structure. I'll tell you why. Because you're ripening 
you're not necessarily ripening the grapes, but because you're concentrating them and saying goodbye to a lot of water, the sugar level comes up. So this does have an apparent sweetness, but Croatina adds structure. There's also Merlot going on to add softness. Corvina adds life, great nerve and acidity. Can I say energy again? And yet when you have this wine at room temperature, you will note that it is a little bit dried fruit and a lot of almost sweetness. That's the idea behind Amarone and Apostimento, the, dry, the fr dried fruit process. I recommend a particular temperature for this wine. I've played with this. I put it in the cellar overnight. I opened it yesterday, had a room temperature, and I thought, I think I know what to do here. I proved it to myself this morning, taking it out of the 58 degree cellar and trying it again. I like it so much better. The fruit is more focused. The sweetness is down. And it's not truly sweet wine, but because it's made of semi-dried fruit, not all the way to raisin, but getting there, you get that thing, you know? Mm. The main idea behind this wine was to give you something with a, a cool story to tell you the pro about the process of apacimento, which is the same process used for Amarone, to explain the funny label, and that's kind of cool and whimsical, right? But mainly to give you a wine that is friendly, easygoing, and kind of like the Batan Toro I just told you about, to provide you and your guests with something to drink this summer on a warm night. And I promise that on a hot night when you almost don't want to have red wine anymore and you also don't want to break the budget, this is not expensive wine, you would cool this down, put it in the fridge for 28-25 minutes or take it out of your 58 degree wine cellar and serve this. Serve it with rich meats. It'll handle, um, it'll, it's got enough mouth and richness to go very nicely with roasted meats. And maybe those ribs I keep talking about. I've got ribs on the brain. A passimento, or passimento, from Verona, the supposedly land of Romeo and Juliet. There is a wine bar in Paris called Juveniles. Yep, a wine bar. This is Cuvée Juveniles. This wine is not from France. <laughs> it's kind of weird, right? A guy named Dave Powell helped start a winery called Torbrek long ago. Dave Powell, an Australian, actually went to Scotland. Why are we talking about Scotland now? He went to Scotland to cut down trees in uh, the northern part of Scotland, the Highlands, I guess they call it. In a forest, one of the forests he worked in was called Torbrek, apparently. He came back to Australia, started a winery called Torbrek, and also during the travels of selling his wine, he met a fellow Scotsman who'd opened a wine bar in Paris called Juveniles. So this Scottish-owned wine bar in the first arrondissement of Paris, which is still there, Juveniles, was admired so much like uh, by David Powell that he decided, with his Scottish preferences, to name a wine after that after that cafe. What I think David Powell was actually very intelligently doing was making a wine for uh, that bistro to call their house wine. In other words, hey, look what I just named after you guys. Don't you want to serve this all the time by the glass? So the wonderful irony is that probably even to this day, Cuvée Juvenile is served at the Paris wine bar called Juvenile. What's interesting about that is Australian wines really don't belong in Paris, stylistically, typically, because they tend to be rather brash, over the top, high alcohol, and without necessarily a sense of, let's say, dexterity and deftness. That's where Torbrek comes in. Torbrek, the winery, which unfortunately Dave Powell has moved on from, you could say he was ousted from it. His, his, uh, his baby, he's no longer there, but he started a new thing and we're trying to catch up with him. At any rate, Torbrek, all the way up and down their uh, scale, this is their entry level red, and they go all the way up to a wine called Runrig, which is about $220 a bottle. In fact, there's another wine costing about $600 a bottle that you hardly ever see. 
at any rate, Torbeck makes wonderful wine, and whereas they do get bigger as you climb that ladder of quality, they always have dexterity and deftness. This quality that a European wine lover would admire. And so that is why, in fact, this works in Paris, and it works for me. Here we are doing a GSM. I've got to go peek on the back of the bottle and tell you what the actual proportions are. We have Grenache happening at 67%, and then 23% uh, Mataro, and 10% Shiraz. Well, by now you know that Shiraz is the same as Syrah, but what was that middle name? But hey, can we back up, rewind? Mataro, yes, Mataro is the Australian's Australian farmer's name, and actually the Oakley, California farmer's name for Mavet. And um, here we go, with a GSM, it saw very, very little oak, and I don't think any of the oak was new oak. And that's the right thing to do with a, a GSM that just wants to say something about balance and fruit and place. Don't let the wood get in the way. Mm. This bottle was also open last Saturday, so this was kind of a test of the longevity. It's doing pretty darn well. It was a little more lively on Saturday, but with that screw cap, uh, kind of keeping all of the activity down, uh, the aging activity, it, it kind of wanted a little bit of air time. At any rate, Torbeck, entry level, with an interesting Scotland and Parisian connection. Juveniles, I wanted to put this in your club, Wine Adventures for many years. We could never get the price right. It finally happened. The quality didn't come down. But finally, because this has changed hands as far as who's distributing it, we got an opportunity. Here you go. You get it. So that does it for the Wine Adventure Wine Club Wines. I'm going to get my skinny glass out as I prepare to tell you about wines of the here and there White Wine Lovers Club. I think that's the name of it. I can't remember. There's something about white wine. Oh, I gotta put this in front of you. Will this fill the screen, perhaps? Why does it fill the screen? Why is that apparently bigger? Because it is bigger. What you've got in front of you is a white wine from a producer called Azul y Garanza. They are located in Navarra, Spain. The connection for me, the reason why we're curating it beyond quality, is value. This is a liter sized bottle. Instead of 750 milliliters, what you wine club members are getting this month is a liter sized bottle. So you get an extra glass of wine in that bottle. How about that? And um, the connection, the other connection is that this is a place I got to visit way back in 2012 with a dear friend named Elizabeth and the Valkyrie. Uh, importers. So Valkyrie Selections is a great importer of Spanish wine and some other things from France. And those guys kindly took me and Elizabeth to Spain in 2012. If you've ever seen the Speedo shot, it appears once in a while on the slideshow upstairs on the mezzanine. That photograph of a bunch of guys in a row, including myself, in Barcelona Football Club Speedos was the first day of that trip and it will live in infamy. At any rate, let's speak more meaningfully for this wine. This is 100% Viura, V-I-U-R-A, having seen zero oak barrels, that's not the idea. This is anti-oak wine. Viura, have you ever heard of it? Maybe not. That's what they call it uh, when they grow it in Rioja and when they call, uh, grow it in Navarra. It also occurs occasionally in Rueda. But when they grow it out west, I'm sorry, out east in Cava country near Barcelona, and when it's involved in the sparkling wine called Cava, it has a slightly more familiar name. Sounds kind of like a dance. Macabeo, Macabeo, Macabeo. At any rate, this is 100% Macabeo or 100% Viura, whatever you'd like to call it, zero oak. And really, it's a mild-mannered wine as far as nose goes. Yeah, I get citrus, I get pear, I get stone fruits. I get apple, all of these vivacious fruits, and yet it doesn't smell intellectual. It doesn't smell like, I, I'm not gonna ponder this. I'm actually gonna go out on the porch and pound it. It's a porch pounder, not a, uh, not a pondering wine. I'm, I'm trying to, I'll work on that line. The main 
thing, the effect, is clarity. When you drink it, you're refreshed. This is all about the wonderful, well, sometimes too wonderful summer heat we're about to experience. And and just totally quenching your palate. If you want to think about having food with this, then do things like fish tacos and um, nichoise salads with wonderful tuna on top. Shellfish like shrimp off the grill would be great. Azul y, azul y garanza, viura or macabeo, macabeo, whatever you want to call it, as I dance to the bottle and take it away from you because there's almost a whole liter left. Yes, liter sized bottle, six glasses of wine in that. Beautiful bottle for you, good price. We've been selling it forever, but that's the new vintage of it. I'm not gonna pour Stone Lay for myself and bring Stone Lay up to you to see the label. Stone Lay Sablanc. A few of you have perhaps already bought this bottle because we talked about it in a video oh, about a month ago and said, we have a wine from Marlboro, New Zealand coming to you that I truly admire as a, let's say, Cloudy Bay style. And Cloudy Bay was, and is, kind of like the high end of Marlboro, New Zealand. There's a lot of Sauvignon Blanc grown there, and some of them cost 10 or $12. In fact, we've given you New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc for two previous months. We had to bring this as kind of like to cap off that demonstration of Kiwi Sau Blancs. One that you've already had did come from Marlboro, and its flavors and smells were a little more audacious, you could say. And then their sister winery from another part of New Zealand showed you more tropicality. Why do I like Stone Lay? Why are we showing you not yet another Kiwi Sauvignon Blanc? I would call this the pinnacle stylistically. This is where to end the conversation for a few months. Let's leave Kiwi Sauvignon Blanc alone, having given you Stone Lay as what I would call totally elegant, at least per the exuberance of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. This, this is the classy shit, okay? You, what you have here is all those flavors, but adjusted down a little bit, like somebody turned down the volume, like the music is usually too loud when you're having <laughs> New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. And somebody wisely just like tamed the beast enough so that even I can drink this stuff. Hmm. This is really good, and I mean it, I can drink this. A lot of New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs are just too much for me. I know that a lot of you like it, but I think I LD'd a long time ago on New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc and just couldn't come back. And then I had this, and I can say that if we can make a Kiwi Sauvignon Blanc moderately, I remain engaged. I am back. Lovely stuff. I'm very pleased to bring you this. And really, for the Cloudy Bay style, it's uh, it's fairly affordable. Since Cloudy Bay, I think will set you back about $30 nowadays, this is not $30. Let us now take you to the two wines we're giving you in our Wine Adventure Wine Club. This does not always happen on purpose, but sometimes when you club members getting two bottles of wine in your particular club are looking at them, you're realizing, hey, there's kind of a theme going on. The theme this time, and it wasn't intentional, like I said, is that we're representing both sides of the Andes Mountains of South America with these two bottlings. So let's bring you first a wine from Chile from the producer Santa Rita. This is called Medalla Real. Gold medal, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. And in fact, it is made of, I got a cheese here. What's it made of? 92% Cabernet Sauvignon and 8% Cabernet Funk. It's uh, 14 months in used barrels. No new barrels were harmed in the making of this wine. Good to hear. The point is, this particular producer started to make their gold medal Wine. They named it that because back in, I think the 80s, they entered their Cabernet in the Paris Wine Olympics. Yes, there is such a thing, or at least it was, where entrants came from all over the world. You know, great Cabernets from the Napa Valley and uh, from France and so on. And that year, Santa Rita's Cabernet beat them all out. Well, 
the accolades keep pouring in, even for this wine, this less expensive wine, which I think might be in the $12 range once your club discount kicks in. It is a 92 pointer from Wine Enthusiast, and more interestingly, Wine Enthusiast actually made it number 11 on their top 100 wines of 2020 list. That's kind of cool that they would say, yeah, there's this $150 bottle that's hard to get, there's this $500 bottle that's impossible to buy or find anywhere, yeah, but we want to include on that list something that you can buy and afford. It's obtainable in price, <laughs> and you can get it at the wine steward. So, you're going to say perhaps, hey, I see this bottle. You, you guys, didn't you guys give us this? Yes, we did. Good point. The two bottles we're giving you in the Tuesday Night Wine Club this month are frequent offenders. In fact, each of them occurred in your wine club within the last year. However, we are fully justified, totally validated by giving you them again because they are new vintages and they taste just as good, if not better, than their forebears. So this Medaille Real, mostly Cabernet, a little bit of Cab Franc, beautiful nose, black olive, tar, dark cherry, cassis, back to the olives. It's kind of like a revolving door of smells. Mm. Mm. There's something I want to tell you about wines in this price category. As I taste and taste and taste and taste them, many of the things you find in the grocery store at this price point taste faked out. They are enriched with sugar. There's things that are done to them in the winery to make them feel more yummy. There are even additives. We could talk about those. We won't. We won't belabor that point. We'll just say that those wines are fixed. They're repaired. They are fabricated to a certain degree, and a good palate will taste it. What I love about this wine, Last Vintage, and this, real. This wine tastes real. Yes, it's ripe, but man, there's structure going along with it, justifying that ripeness. And there's tons of things to say about it. Wow, black olives, again, cherries, dark earth that's just been turned, like a, a, a tractor just went by on a, a, a field in January and turned the earth. Black earth, dirt clods, having just been turned, still moist, giving off that damp. Yeah. Did I say herbs? Fresh herbs? I think I said olives. <laughs> I know I did. Mm. That's a great performer. That's 92 points from somebody, yeah, like I said, wine enthusiast. Forget that. We taste, I probably tasted like 200 wines in order to find you these 12. It takes a lot of work. Aren't you sorry for me? Let's go over the Andes to Argentina. Let's go to Familia Zucardi for a wine called Santa Julia. Wait a minute, I just said Zucardi? Yes. Zucardi is kind of the mother winery, and for their less expensive wines, they have another brand called Santa Julia. Um, wow, look at that, it says 92 points right on it. I don't even have to tell you. I know. We're not all about the points, we just know that some of you like them, and apparently they think you do too, so they put that on there. Even before this wine got labeled and uh, had the foil put on it, they knew they had a nice rating, so they meant, uh, they meant to do that. Santa Julia, or Zucardi, whatever you want to call him, very thoughtful producer in the Uco Valley. The Uco Valley is the southernmost part of Mendoza, Argentina. We're at 3,000 to 4,000, actually up to 4,500 feet where this is grown, and when I was first there, um, we landed in the evening, so I didn't really see where we were. I didn't get my bearings. We went to the first winery visit, and everything was kind of fogged in. We were in a wine tasting room with enormous windows, and I thought, what's the deal with the windows? All we're looking out and seeing is fog. And then somebody tapped me on the shoulder five minutes later, whereas I thought we were on total flat land and nowhere near anything called a mountain, even though they were telling us we were at 3,500 feet. I was tapped on the shoulder to be redirected with my gaze out those windows again, and my god, the backdrop of the Andes and mountains appeared. It was like a movie set. It's really beautiful there. And um, in fact, even though you're on basically level land here, you are already at 
35 to 4,000 feet, and those towering mountains go up, obviously, much higher from there. And you're looking at them and saying, this is really unique wine country. The Uco Valley is different from other parts of Mendoza with often a higher mineral content in the soil, and that gives you more structure. And it is, in fact, higher in elevation, too. You're, you're foothills of the Andes here. And what you've got in here, in front of you, is the Mountain Blend, very appropriately named Mountain Blend. What is the blend? Well, we're in Argentina, right? So wouldn't you think Malbec would be a main ingredient? It is. 70% Malbec and 30%. What is my other favorite red grape from Argentina? Anybody? Anybody? Is it Bonarda? Well, sometimes. Is it Cabernet? Occasionally. But what really works here is Cabernet Franc. So this is 70-30, Malbec Cab Franc, happening in the Mountain Blend. Another label you Tuesday Night Wine Club members have seen before, and in fact recently, but it's the new vintage, 92 points, forget all that. Top 100, forget all that. The wine's really good. More fruit forward than what happened over in Chile. Chile often acts like the Bordeaux of South America for me. Like the flavors are a little more complex and less fruit forward. Here's more fruit, but it's smart fruit. It's fruit with energy. There's that word again. Mm. You're going to be back for more of this wine. More tannin, but the tannins are sweet. You know what tannins are? Do you know what I mean by when they're sweet? Yes, we want some grip in the mouth, but we don't want dry tannins. They're just unhappy, they're, they're mean. Sweet tannins, yeah, I like chewing on this. It's like, hmm, good sweet tannins here. Lovely wine again, Santa Julia. We saved the best for last, or at least the best as some of you would calculate the best. And we have yet another relationship going on between the two wines for the Red Collector Club. What we're gonna talk about first is this Von Strasser, 2018 Von Strasser Cabernet Sauvignon. It's 78% Cabernet Sauvignon, 4% Merlot, 10% Petit Bordeaux, and 8% Malbec. So several of the Bordeaux varieties are represented in there, but you know, the Napa Valley is cab country. And what's weird though, is that we have to call it the Napa Valley, and yet if you look carefully at the label, it might show up there, it says Diamond Mountain District. Yes, this is in fact a mountain wine. This is not valley floor. And that will be true of the other Red Collector wine this month. This month, you Red Collector Wine Club members are getting two mountain wines. If we have to generalize about mountain versus valley wines as it pertains to Cabernet, or really a lot of other great varieties as well, what happens on the mountain? What's been happening over the eons? Erosion, right? What you have are uh, soils that are eroded. In fact, they're less and less soil and more and more rock. You have all the goodies, all the nutrients, all that generous soil landing down on the valley floor, settling there, and down there, the vines are happy. The vines produce a bigger crop. The vines produce a fruitier crop. The soil is more fertile. A river runs through it, you know, all that. But up on the mountain, Austerity. Up on the mountain, rock. The vines struggle. The vines, uh, Cabernet vine or otherwise, will grow a smaller berry. And a smaller berry means there's less juice in that berry compared to the amount of skin surrounding it. So you have a higher what's called skin to juice ratio. That makes a darker wine. That makes a more tannic wine. Mountain wines with that struggling vine, all that mineral in the soil, and that smaller berry um, ideal, all of those add up to darkness of color, structure in the mouth, tannin, we often call it, and a wine in general that ages longer. The valley floor, Cabernet, easy going, drink it sooner. The mountain wine, wait, 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 or accommodate it with protein, right? If you want to not wait, drink that wine decanted perhaps with food. 
Von Strasser, I think we've clubbed it once before, but I have been seeing this label ever since the wine steward opened. Even before the wine steward opened, I once took a drive up to Von Strasser and bought Randy's Basket Press off of him so that I could bring it back and Tim and I could make wine in his Basket Bladder Press at Livermore Valley Cellars. So I've been aware of Rudy at Von Strasser for a long time. Rudy's gotten, Rudy's gotten older and this may be one of his last vintages produced from what I'm hearing. So it's kind of like, finally, we've got to get in on doing some Von Strasser for him. Mountain Wine. Let's point out that whereas these wines are both mountain wines, I'll describe the other one next. I will tell you that Diamond Mountain generally faces east. What does that mean? Morning sun, and by the time the afternoon is hitting and the hottest part of the day, the sun might actually be disappearing from the vineyards. So I always feel like Spring Mountain, Diamond Mountain, and Mount Beter, those are all along the east-facing side of the Mayacamas Mountains. Like if you go up the Napa Valley, if you're heading north in the Napa Valley and looking to the left, you're looking at the Mayacamas, and those Appalachians, Veter and Spring Mountain and Diamond Mountain, they're all looking at morning sun, and they're, they're benefiting or not benefiting by getting after, as much afternoon sun. I think it's cool. When you have east-facing Cabernet, and this is, we're generalizing here, you tend to get slightly more, I don't want to say gloomy, but you get more mysterious Cabernet qualities. Yeah. Von Strasser always does that for you because Von Strasser always comes from Diamond Mountain. That's what I like about great wine is it references place. It declares place. Mm. Yes, there's fruit. Don't be afraid. But the fruit comes with an obsidian-like rock and um, flavors that are not entirely fruit. There's a lot of earth. There's a lot of that olive I keep talking about today. Should I say energy again? <laughs> You'll shoot me. Anyway, think of it. Morning sun wine. We're about to have afternoon sun wine, but we'll still be on a mountain. Good stuff. Ageable. I think you can get after it right now with a ribeye, but you can lay this stuff down too. And that's, like I said before, a great attribute of mountain wine. Let's take you to the final wine of the video. The second of the Red Collector Club wines. We are taking you to good old Stone Street. What's the connection here for me? Rudy. The guy from whom I bought a basket press was one connection with that last wine. Stone Street is a wine we have bought from a beautiful woman named Jenna, a great guy named Kyle, a lovely young lady named Taylor, and now Samantha. This is, I believe, her second wine club wine with the wine steward. Welcome, Samantha. She is now our regal Jackson family rep. And what remains the same? in spite of the baton being passed from rep to rep showing us this wine, is that Stone Street stays in one place that is not in the Alexander Valley, as the label implies. Alexander Valley Cabernet, doesn't that imply Valley of Floor to you? Yes, and it does to me. Misnomer, misapplied to this label. However, there is no ABA name for the mountains that rise above. This is grown at 400 feet and up to 2,400 feet. The parcels that Stone Street owns in one 5,000 acre area, only 900 acres planted, planted on it, well above the valley floor. And yet, there was no name. A name is coming, I can't remember the name of it, but I believe finally, this area will be appropriately named, implying that yes, we're on a mountain, we're not on the valley floor. Now, we are on the west side of uh, the mountain range. If you were going up the Alexander Valley and looking to your right, if you're going north and look to your right, what does that mean? It means that those slopes see a sun spanking from the afternoon sun. What is wonderful about this is that the minerality that comes from mountain wine, all that erosion, the fact that vines have to struggle, put out a smaller berry, that is still happening here even though more afternoon sun happens here. This, huh, somebody said it right, and I would concur. I wish I had said it. 
This has 92s and 93s across the board from five different critics. And one of those critics, as I was reading the fine print, said, this is a look-alike for top Bordeaux. And I do totally believe that if you're putting yourself in a mindset of like somebody's just poured great Bordeaux for you, you don't know what it is, but you're smelling it, you are saying, I'm having great Bordeaux. We're having like $150 quality Bordeaux here in a bottle that does not cost that. You're getting that effect. Cassis and coffee bean, espresso, berries, man, it smells good. Mm. On the palate, a Bordeaux-like quality, acidity and juicy richness. The reason why this is a little more accommodating than the Von Strasser is because it's two years older. The Von Strasser is a 2018. This Stone Street is a 16. A lovely vintage for California. Thoughtful wines. Mountain wines, I love it when a Cabernet customer comes in and says, Valley floor, great, but I'm cooking tonight. I'm doing meat. We are roasting. We're doing, let's say, short ribs, uh, braising. We need mountain cab. I take you straight to these, and I appreciate it when people think that much. Some Cabernet drinkers are just like, hey, give me a cab. And they have an expectation of easygoing fruit, and we know what to give them. But when we sense a little bit of thoughtfulness going on, and perhaps a meal going on as well, that's when these wines come into play. I appreciate your listening to all this, or at least finding your wine in the video. I hope this works for you guys because I have a feeling a new way of doing the Wine Club Notes is born. The Wine Club Notes might not be quite as long and exhaustive. Many of you might prefer to see and hear rather than read. So let's just try to do it both ways. <laughs> I'm a big advocate for that. And um, thanks so much. Come and get your wine club wine. I've already got mine. See you soon.